with the name view. If you choose it, you can select the side by side view. So you can see just the presentation and the speaker. When you move with your mouse over the screen and go to the edge of the presentation screen, you'll see an arrow that enables you to enlarge the presentation screen. You can adapt it uh, to whatever you like. Um, uh, so I already taught you during the break, uh, the coffee break and the lunch break, there will be breakout rooms and you will find uh, um, the symbol of the breakout rooms in the menu bar below your screen, but only after they have been opened. So there is nothing to see now, but if you look, have a look um, by the start of the break, you will find the, the breakout rooms there. You can choose any breakout room you like. And uh, we ask the speakers to also join one of the breakout rooms according to the theme of their presentation. But you can also go to another theme or to the just the meeting room. That's also a possibility. In the breakout room, you can use uh, your uh, camera and your microphone to take an active part in the discussion. But uh, you can also leave everything switched off and just listen and take part, just listen to the discussions and uh, enjoy it like that. You can always, whenever you like, change the breakout room. That is no problem at all. Um, uh, after um, the uh, symposium, um, all the speakers agreed to make their uh, presentation available on YouTube. So in case you miss something, you can always uh, check later on YouTube. So there is lots of needs to work on butterflies and have some nice days of knowledge exchange and discussions. And let's get started. Our first speaker is uh, Michiel Vallis de Vries who also uh, is one of the members of the organizing team. Um, Michiel uh, originally worked on the effects of uh, grazing of large herbivores, but was later hit by the love of butterflies. So now the large herbivores are a factor affecting uh, um, the habitats of butterflies. He's a project leader at uh, Dutch Butterfly Conservation and he is Special Professor for Ecology and Conservation of Insects at Wageningen University. Scientific work obviously is uh, needed as well as citizen science work to realize evidence-based conservation and to help, to, to, to help threatened species to find their specific needs and work on that in conservation. Michiel, please share your screen with us and um, tell us everything um, you know on future of butterflies and of moth and how to hold the decline of the species. Okay, thank you for this very nice introduction, Irma. Uh, I hope you can all see my screen. Irma, is it uh, correct uh, like this? I can see your screen, yes. Okay. Um, and uh, I'm uh, delighted to be uh, here to open this uh, this symposium, uh, this opening lecture, and um, I uh, think that we have serious business to do because we have to answer this question: Can we halt uh, the decline of butterflies and moths in Europe? And uh, in the next lecture, Frank Fassen uh, will uh, offer a perspective from the policy side from the EU. But here I will outline the sort of the, the playing field. Uh, that we're dealing with at this symposium, but also in uh, the conservation of butterflies and, uh, and moths. Um, but first, uh, let me welcome you uh, from wherever you are in uh, about uh, 300 participants have uh, registered. So uh, we're a whole uh, audience that extends across the globe, not only in many countries of Europe, including Kosovo, I see, uh, but also outside Europe uh, in the Americas and in Asia and even in Africa. Um, and uh, I would like to extend uh, the welcome to Matt Forrester, who will deliver uh, a very, uh, for him, a very late night uh, uh, presentation tomorrow 
morning from the US and offer an American perspective on the future of butterflies. So looking forward to that as well. Okay. Um, so uh, since our last symposium uh, here in uh, Wageningen in 2016, the world has uh, changed uh, quite a bit in many respects, of course, but one of the aspects was uh, that uh, insect declines were suddenly in the, in the spotlights. Uh, from a butterfly conservation point of view, of course, we had already pointing out, pointing at declines for a much uh, longer period, but suddenly also the media took up the message and it was a big discussion in, in politics as well. Insect Armageddon and, and what should we do about it? Uh, well, this was evidence from uh, uh, a lot of German uh, sites in northern Germany. But then the question was also raised, uh, do these declines occur elsewhere as well? And then uh, it was, of course, very difficult to find real evidence and uh, fortunately, we have been working on monitoring in butterfly, uh, monitoring butterflies in, in Europe and elsewhere as well, uh, uh, with increasing effort. And nowadays, uh, the monitoring network extends uh, well over Europe with all the blue dots uh, covering uh, the UK and, and the Netherlands and Switzerland almost completely, but elsewhere it's, it's spreading like a pandemic perhaps, uh, but then a good one. And uh, David Roy will tell you uh, all about it uh, later on. Uh, but uh, these uh, data generated from the monitoring schemes allowed us to uh, assess trends and also to answer the question of the ministry is insect declining a problem here in the Netherlands as well? Well, unfortunately it is because we see that butterflies have declined uh, about 50% since 1992. So perhaps not 75%, but already a very serious uh, decline. Uh, and these declines have, have been documented thanks to our nationwide monitoring scheme. Well, that's of course the first step in, in assessing how butterflies are doing. And uh, fortunately with moths, we have increasing evidence for that as well. Our uh, monitoring scheme in the Netherlands is only young, but in the UK, uh, there's data from uh, much further back. And these also point to uh, declines, about a third of decline in, uh, in abundance over a period of 50 years in the whole of the UK and uh, about a 40% decline in Southern Britain alone. So also serious declines over there. And it is uh, of course uh, true that these declines have not, not started recently. It's been uh, a much greater period of land use uh, change that is affecting our butterfly and moth communities. But the data, of course, are uh, very rare to assess these changes. Fortunately, with the Dutch uh, butterfly data, we've been able to uh, at least assess not changes in abundance over a century, but changes in, in occurrence. And uh, these point to very serious declines of uh, two thirds of decline in butterfly occurrence before 1990. And when you combine this with the halving of butterfly abundance since 1990, then you arrive at an overall decline uh, that exceeds 80% and rather approaches 90% even over whole century. So it's really serious. And then the next question is, of course, uh, before starting to be able to do anything about it, what are the drivers of these declines? And we now have the time for a little poll and I hope it all works and you can select the top three of the most important uh, threats uh, that you think are playing a role. Um, and uh, so I hope everybody is filling this in. Um, oh, wow. Um, 
Oh, there's well, 51 votes. Uh, maybe uh, it's not not the end uh, of it, but uh, certainly agricultural intensification is a um, big one, and uh, climate change, abandonment, nitrogen deposition also play a big role okay we'll see uh, we'll repeat this uh, survey uh, later on and uh, see if your opinions have uh, have changed uh, with uh, the information offered in our presentations okay um let's uh, continue here um well certainly the the in shaping these drivers uh, the uh, rise of of human influence has, has been a very uh, crucial first with uh, with three revolutions going on the agricultural revolution of domesticating plants and and animals uh, in in prehistoric times the industrial uh, revolution leading to the use of fossil fuels and uh, climate uh, generating climate change and then lastly the green uh revolution of the uh, past uh, century uh, with the help of chemical uh, uh, fertilizers that led to uh, large-scale agricultural intensification and also of course problems with nitrogen deposition due to these uh, chemical fertilizers and uh, it's being uh, a, a big problem for our government at the moment to solve this nitrogen crisis uh, next to the pandemic and it's really uh, we've just chosen our uh, new government and it will be a serious uh, a matter on the uh, on their agenda well uh, other issues that have come up recently uh, and also good studies about the impacts of it have been uh, pesticides especially also this new generation of pesticide of systemic pesticides like neonicotinoids and and fipronil, fipronil. and we've seen uh, important impact effects of those on um, insect uh, activity and reproduction but also even on population trends and uh, so it's not only about direct mortality but also about sublethal effects that lead to increased mortality and reduced uh, populations later on and unfortunately this has led to political action as well with uh, an eu wide ban of neonicotinoids but these are still working in the environments because they're quite persistent in soil and water Another issue that's been coming up is the impact of light pollution. Uh, it looks very nice to, to see uh, this, uh, the earth from the skies and, and see all the, the light dots, but for moths, it's really uh, a big problem. Um, and a problem that's being gradually investigated. And uh, Thomas Merckx in his lecture will probably shed more light on it even. Uh, but certainly there are there's increasing evidence on uh, the activity of moths and reproduction of moths being affected by uh, light pollution, but also the first evidence on uh, trends being more serious in light attracted uh, moths is emerging. Well, uh, how can we get a, a grip on uh, on the, those drivers? Well, uh, one of the possibilities is to use uh, uh, indicator groups of different uh, butterfly and, and moth species. And here I've distinguished uh, widespread species, a group of 24 widespread species um, occurring across the country and species that are more restricted to semi-natural habitats so more to our protected areas. And you see quite a, a difference between the two. The widespread species are gradually declining um, and showing the, the, well, increasing deterioration of our, especially our farmlands, but also our urban habitats. Whereas the species from semi-natural areas uh, show rather some variation in the trend with a very serious decline early on but then a stabilization and even a, a move towards recovery uh, later on 
and that's certainly be uh, the uh, result of uh, growing attention for developing our nature network. So really credits to, uh, to both policy and also uh, practitioners that helped in restoring habitats. But also uh, we've seen a reverse of this recovery in the last years with increasing climatic extremes. Uh, and we've uh, had three drought years in a row and these have really led to especially serious declines in these species from our uh, protected areas. So that's a, a first step in, in getting a grip on these, uh, these declines. Uh, but of course, we need to work also on discovering the, the mechanisms. And here uh, I want to uh, highlight some large scale changes that have taken place uh, under climate change, but um, uh, moderated by uh, habitat availability. And uh, Thomas Fartman later on will continue about uh, drivers, about drivers of uh, butterfly uh, changes at uh, scales from the landscape to microhabitats. But here I want to discuss some regional changes so at larger spatial scales from the butterfly monitoring work that has been carried out in the Netherlands and in Finland, um, where we see that climate uh, change affects community composition um, in, in different ways, um, depending on whether the amount of habitat, of semi-natural habitat, is small or large, and whether this habitat is dispersed or aggregated. And different species, of course, respond differently to that. And we see that uh, when focusing on the, the, the colonization of species from warmer regions, uh, we see that this colonization is, a species, is more successful in uh, areas where habitat is more dispersed across the country. And this uh, speckled wood, Peragi Egeria, has uh, greatly benefited from this. And the message here is that to allow these range shifts to occur, you really should work on uh, promoting connectivity. But on the other hand, you uh, have uh, an, the species that are uh, facing the threat of extinctions, especially the species from cooler regions that are not so much responding to the spatial configuration of the habitat, but more from its aggregation. So these extinctions are less in large aggregated habitats. And uh, this, the message here is a different one that to preserve these species, you should really promote robust ecosystem and uh, direct your restoration work on that. And we have gone on a step further in trying to also link uh, these uh, changes, uh, these different responses to species traits. And you see uh, a big role in uh, for, well, species uh, resource specialization in especially uh, the extinction of the cold adapted species uh, more specialized uh, species to a limited number of host plants face larger extinction risks. But across these uh, warm and cold adapted uh, species, you see an important role of mobility and, and generation time with uh, greater colonization success uh, for mobile species for uh, in, in in the warm adapted species, but also greater extinction risks in sedentary species that are cold adapted. And on the other hand, the uh, multivoltine species with short generation times are more successful in their range shifts, whereas species with uh, slow development, uh, just with a single generation a year, face increased extinction risks. Um, well, that is getting us uh, certainly ahead in, in understanding the, the mechanisms, uh, but we also should keep an open eye for the complexities in interactions between drivers. And uh, here um, is a result from a study that we already published uh, 15 years ago about uh, the impact of 
combined impact of climate change and nitrogen deposition on uh, species with different uh, hibernation modes. And we saw increased declines. Uh, so the threshold of decline is depicted here as, uh, oops, I didn't use my pointer yet. So I will use it now. Um, you, this red line is showing the threshold of 80% decline for species hibernating as eggs or caterpillars that develop in early spring. And here is the threshold for the species hibernating as, as pupae or adults. And you see that for the, uh, the spring developing species, the threshold is at a lower level of nitrogen deposition. So it's exceeded already at lower levels of nitrogen deposition and lower uh, temperatures. And uh, this is uh, due to a phenologic, phenological mismatch um, where plants actually take a head start at low uh, nitrogen, uh, low temperatures um, in spring. Uh, but uh, with climate warming, uh, this head start is growing bigger and it's uh, aggravated by increasing levels of nitrogen deposition. And then the increasing green plant canopy results in microclimatic cooling where the uh, caterpillars cannot achieve uh, fast developments. Um, and this study has been uh, inspired to a large extent by uh, our work on uh, Melitea syncytia, um, which has nice uh, thermophilus uh, caterpillars living in, in groups. Um, and this species is an iconic one because it's also served as a model for metapopulation uh, ecology. And it's been investigated thoroughly in, in Finland and the University of Helsinki. And this group has also um, uh, produced a nice paper just recently, also indicating a phenological mismatch in that region due to climate change in a low nitrogen environment. But this uh, phenological mismatch is, has developed in a different direction because here uh, it's not the, the plants that uh, have a head start compared to the caterpillars, but the caterpillars that uh, in the, the low productive environment become active earlier than the plants are growing. So there, that results in a food shortage for the developing uh, caterpillars and also uh, results in, in mortality and reduced uh, populations. So in, in both case, cases, you see a phenological mismatch occurring, but then in different directions, which uh, I think is uh, well alarming, but also quite interesting. And it's one of the complexities that we need to grasp. OK, so how can we halt these declines? I think we have uh, time for another poll here um, about conservation measures that we need to take in order to um, solve this problem. Mm. Ah. Oh, I don't think the ah, the poll should be opened. Well, it doesn't seem to work. Ah, OK. Ah, there we yes. go. There we go. OK, yes, a lot of uh, a lot of measures need to be taken, I think. Um, and uh, habitat management is an important one and greening of agriculture, but then not in only green, but in a multicolored way, I think, is an, really an important and strengthening nature networks. Well, yeah, it's a multi-dimensional puzzle um, with uh, where we should especially spend uh, attention to habitat management. Um, and we'll see also whether you have changed your opinions later on. Uh, certainly, we are 
seeming to need a really uh, a fourth revolution as uh, humanity to develop uh, a more ecologically sound way to deal with our environment. And I suggest that we uh, uh, adopt uh, all of us, perhaps a lepidopteran perspective on the Anthropocene. Um, uh, the, the Roger Dennis and Tim Shreve and Hans van Dijk developed this resource-based habitat concept that still is serving us well and that will also be at the heart of many studies that are will be discussed here. And I think it's also a nice way for humanity to go on. Um, work evidence-based, that's also a good advice. Engage society, uh, not only in monitoring, but also in, uh, in raising awareness and be motivated by natural diversity. And so I hope this will offer a source of inspiration uh, in your work, but also when going outdoors and counting butterflies and moths. And I hope these uh, items will continue to inspire you. And of course, during the lectures, we'll uh, also um, be spending attention to those themes where engaging society will be discussed also by uh, Jacqueline Loos tomorrow with us on the social ecological perspectives using butterflies. And uh, the natural diversity will certainly be treated in uh, genetic terms by Vlad uh, Dinka in his lecture also tomorrow. So uh, we'll uh, cover a range of subjects and I hope you will uh, uh, agree with us uh, in the end that it was worth to organize this symposium. Thank you. Michiel, thank you very much for uh, your presentation. Um, there is uh, one question coming in. It's about uh, um, the poll. The threats in the poll are highly related. Nitrogen deposition and exposure to biocides are consequences of intensification of agriculture. In a sense, abandonment as well as extensive agriculture is becoming unprofitable. And even tourism is increasing in nature as large parts of the landscapes are changed into ugly agro industry. How do you see a way out of this? Well, I think this uh, resource-based uh, habitat concept can actually help us because we need to focus on, uh, on what resources are available to us and uh, can continue to be available for us without us depleting them. And uh, of course, our present uh, way of, of land use is highly dependent on a continuous um, use of, uh, well, fossil fuels, but also uh, chemical uh, fertilizers. And we see that these resources are not, not endless. So we need to develop a way uh, of, um, well, really sustainable land use. That's been a, a, a topic for quite some time, but now we should really put it into practice and not only discuss it. Thank you. It's also uh, uh, inspiring that in one way uh, uh, actions are needed at political level, top down uh, actions from governments, but uh, um, the most needed action for the butterflies is uh, making sure that habitat management, so the very large scale, is adapted to their needs. So uh, that is really uh, an interesting uh, conflict that we have to discuss more about. Thank you, Michiel. I would like to move on to our next speaker. And uh, our next speaker is uh, Frank Fasen, who is a policy officer at DG Environment with close connections to European Commission. And he's in many ways uh, um, already involved in conservation of nature. After all, the full implementation of the EU nature legislation to protect the biodiversity is essential and the organizations working in the field, so the NGOs and uh, the owners of nature areas, really need the support of the policy level in Brussels. So we are very happy to have Frank um, with our speakers. Uh, and he's involved in life projects for invertebrate conservation, but also Natura 2000, monitoring pollinators and many other items. 
He also knows a lot about butterflies, uh, such as the small copper, Lysina hellae, and many other threatened species of especially the wet habitats. I'm looking forward to hearing your presentation, Frank. The floor uh, is yours. Please uh, share the screen with all of us. Oh, by the way, the moderator for Frank's presentation is Bas Oteman. So if you have questions, please address them in the chat to Bas Oteman. Thank you. Thank you, Irma. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you can see the presentation fully. Um, yes, I, I cannot start this presentation without giving a reminder of uh, the European Habitats Directive, which is still our cornerstone in terms of nature conservation policy at European Union level. The Habitats Directive is dating from 1992. It's a very old piece of legislation. It's one of the first environmental pieces of legislation together with the EU Birds Directive, which is even older. And it has recently undergone a fitness check, uh, a check basically to see whether it's still fit for purpose. And uh, that check generated a huge uh, reaction from the public. Uh, a big public consultation took place. And the overwhelming conclusion was that uh, despite being a rather old piece of legislation, it shouldn't be changed. So it's still fit for purpose. And that was also the overwhelming conclusion of the council and the European parliament and other European institutions. So in the end, uh, despite it's rather big, lo lo I mean, long standing uh, age, it's, it's, it's not going to be changed soon. And uh, it's perhaps important to remind a few key elements of the directive. Well, first of all, it is focused on certain habitats and species which are listed in its annexes. And for all of those, it aims at the achievement of favorable conservation status. So favorable conservation status is defined in terms of the range, in terms of the quality of habitat, population size, et cetera. There's a whole range of parameters which together define whether a species or a habitat has achieved favorable conservation status. And this is then measured in the terms of distance to target. Huh? The, the, the further away we are from that ideal status, the worse the conservation status is uh, considered or assessed. Um, the main mechanism of the directives, uh, both the birds and habitats directive, is the establishment of a network of protected areas that is called collectively Natura 2000. And uh, as many of you know, uh, setting up that network was a rather difficult and painful process um, with a lot of tension. Um, the network uh, is now largely considered to be completed on land, which means that the most important occurrences of all the species and habitats are now in the network, at least on land, not at the marine area. Uh, it covers 18% of the EU land area and about 9% of the sea area. These figures are, however, pre-Brexit. And in fact, the reality is that we are slightly above 18% for the land area. Uh, now, the, the, the philosophy of Nature 2000 is that you establish a network of the most important sites for a given species or habitat and uh, that these sites are a bit the, the safeguard of the biodiversity in Europe uh, for these species and habitats. Sorry, Frank, Frank, may I interrupt you uh, uh, for a while? I see on my screen that there are some gray shaded areas in your presentation. Yeah, I, I is don't it better know. now? Um, yeah, that is better. Okay. Can you please make the, the, the one at the top also a bit smaller? I'm not sure I can do it. I'm afraid there is no function to get rid of it. Oh, okay, so then we leave it like that. I think we can. Yeah, unfortunately, we have to live with it. I... Okay, thank you. I don't thank know. I can. Know. Yeah, I cannot really get rid of it. I'm sorry. Okay, no problem. Um, so, in fact, the, um, yes. So the idea is that uh, collectively, the sites, let's say. Um, 
contain the most important occurrences of all these species and habitats. And there is a legal requirement for non-deterioration at the level of each individual site. So the site should not be deteriorated. And that means that the species and habitats in the site should not uh, deteriorate either. And this also requires uh, an effective management of the sites. But in addition, it's not just about maintaining what is there. The directive, as you say, as I said, is, is about achieving favorable conservation status. So you need to work towards that by, in certain cases, uh, doing restoration in the sites. And that requires that we have specific conservation objectives and measures. And this is something that is still not yet fully in place in many sites. We still have a lot of sites that are not well managed and do not have these measures in place. At the Euro European Commission level, uh, basically we don't have a, a financial instrument for the financing of Natura 2000, not a single one. So uh, the approach is one of integration of the management costs and the, 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 the financing of Natura 2000 and conservation in the whole range of EU financial instruments. We have the LIFE program, it's relatively small, but as you know, the bulk of the financing comes from the agricultural funding and uh, in the case of restoration, even from some other EU funds. And then the, there is a reporting requirement for each of the member states. So every six years they report on the status and trends of all the species and habitats. And that is basically our main information source in terms of progress or not of uh, implementation of the directives. So I'm trying to switch to the next slide. Yes. Uh, so this is just a reminder. This is the Natura 2000 network as it stands now. And as I said, it is considered to be complete, um, meaning that the most important occurrences of species and habitats are in the network. It covers so 20, almost 28,000 sites uh, in total. And this is another interesting element. So just to remind that the directive covers the protection of specific habitats, like these mountain hay meadows, these bog woodlands, or these heathlands. But it also covers the protection of certain habitats of species. And this is the example that I'm giving here on the, on the right on bottom. Uh, so it's not just about these 231 habitat types. It's a lot about uh, additional areas that are not classified as habitats, but that it are important for these species. Uh, so, so sorry, Frank, um, I have to interrupt you again. Yeah. Um, the, your presentation is uh, stuck on the sheet EU Habitat Directives 2092. So oh, I I'm sorry, we... that's not the case in my screen. Yeah. Hmm. I'll try again. We see the beautiful picture of the marsh fritillary, and um, after that it stopped. Yeah. Now, now... I see four habitats uh, yep. sites. Okay, so I go to the next slide. Let me know if there is a problem. I only see your screen, your, yeah. If you put it back into present, yeah, thank you. Beautiful. Okay, it's a bit slow, I find, apparently. Okay. So what are the conclusions of the latest reporting of uh, the state of nature? I only give those that are relevant for the grasslands and for the pollinators. Um, Unfortunately, we don't have separate information for butterflies, but obviously the overall trend is the one of further decrease, uh, as was mentioned before. And uh, in the last six years, we had reported declines of area uh, by the member states in 30% of all the habitats. So there is still a loss of habitat area that is ongoing. And this loss, unfortunately, it's bigger for grasslands and for dune habitats, 45% uh, and 38% of the habitats are declining. So, and uh, in addition, and that is also nothing new to you, uh, the remaining grasslands are in poor status. Uh, and that is both due to land abandonment and natural succession uh, on one hand and agricultural intensification and excessive fertilization and other let's say intensification linked factors 
on the other hand, and I was struck by the, the first poll, which was very much on the intensification side and less on the land abandonment side. But at the EU level as a whole, land abandonment plays quite an important role, including in protected areas. If we look at the pollinator relevant habitats in particular, and we have now data on what are the most important grassland habitats, uh, forest habitats, etc., for pollinators, we see that those that are the most important for pollinators are even declining worse than the others in the habitat group. And this is especially true for grasslands and sclerophyllous scrub. So we can say, we can conclude that in fact, the worst declines that we have at the EU level are very much linked to those habitats that are the most important for pollinators and butterflies. Now, in addition to uh, the reporting by the member states from the Habitats and Birds Directive, we have some other important uh, pieces of information to complement this information. And the first one is the monitoring that we have on the common species, which was for a long time focused on the information that comes from the Pan-European Common Bird Monitoring Scheme, but which recently has been complemented by the butterfly indicators. And as many of you know, uh, we have given some support in the frame of ABLE projects uh, to some of you uh, to further develop uh, the butterfly monitoring indicator. And as you can see here on the bottom, uh, well, the, the picture is not very good. Um, maybe just to emphasize that one of the reasons why uh, there is additional support to butterflies is that the butterflies give much better information when it comes to semi-natural grasslands where the birds indicator is much less interesting. So this is for the common species. On the other hand, over the last 15 years, there has been a lot of progress also looking at the habitats and species and the threat stages that are not covered by the EU nature directive. So we looked at entire species groups and uh, did some European red listing with IUCN and other players. And we had recently also developed a European red list for a whole range of groups of uh, pollinating insects, starting with the butterflies, uh, the bees, uh, now ongoing the red list of hoverflies, and soon to start a red list of moths. And in the future, these exercises will be repeated at a regular pace, probably every 10 years. And we are already programming uh, in the frame of a new big uh, pilot project, uh, a second phase, so an update of, uh, of some of the red lists that you see here. And this gives us, of course, a full picture of all the species and habitats that are uh, and the threat level in each of the, if the groups. Other policy relevant information sources I should mention and I mention here only those where we intervene, huh? not the science, huh? which is uh, so scientific publications are not very much something that we directly supported. This is more uh, supported to, to other funding sources. Uh, but we, we think we can have uh, some uh, direct impact when it comes to the promotion of, of citizen science, which is becoming increasingly important. And we have done this in the past, uh, starting with the birds. And I give here an example, the European bird portal, where basically uh, the information from citizens is brought together at the European scale. Uh, this is basically a weekly update of the migrating patterns of birds. And in, in fact, I think there is a huge potential for upgrading this to other groups in particular to, to uh, the more let's say the better monitor groups like the butterflies. So this is something to consider in the future because it gives us a much more detailed and accurate picture of what is ongoing at a finer uh, spatial scale. And I think we should really tap into that potential of people getting more and more interested and engaged in, in citizen science data collection. On the other extreme, we are increasingly looking into data from remote sensing. We have much better satellites nowadays, higher number of satellites, more frequent pictures, higher resolution, all kinds of different sensors. And the first exercise that we did was to create a data set of the most important uh, Natura 2000 sites for grasslands. And this exercise is still ongoing but there is already some interesting results. 
Unfortunately, it's very much only used by academics, uh, but in fact, there is certainly potential to use it more widely, including to monitor uh, the status of the sites. Um, and maybe I, I'd like to make a little an announcement. Uh, before the end of this year, we will make a major jump in terms of the monitoring of the sites through a new approach where we will have annual updates of land cover maps for all the grassland sites that are relevant for Natura 2000. And, um, and so you will be able to see uh, the evolution of the grassland cover in all these Natura 2000 sites on an annual basis since 1994. So just to give some key conclusions, I'm, I'm aware that there, there is nothing really new here, but I think it's important to remind them uh, the main trend is still one of deterioration. And in particular for open and management dependent habitats, uh, such as the ones that are important for pollinators and butterflies. Uh, as regards Natura 2000, um, unfortunately, this is also still work in progress. A lot of sites are still not properly managed. Uh, and a lot of sites also, despite being formally complete, uh, remain too small and isolated or are not sufficiently buffered against external pressures. And hence, we see that even in the sites, they continue to lose their values. Uh, on the other hand, we have also a lot of local successes, many of which we know from the LIFE program, uh, where declines have been halted or even reversed. Uh, and I think this is an important message to convey, despite all the deterioration that we see, that restoration can deliver. And it's a question of the effort of investment of the resources that we are willing to allocate to restoration measures and to better protection of key sites. And we also, in many cases, we need better and more connected sites. So we know what needs to be done. I think there is not much uh, secret about what is needed and habitat restoration was mentioned uh, as a key element in the poll recently. So we need to, uh, to step up these approaches. We need more resources. And this is one of the key areas of our work in the commission to make sure that these resources are made available. And I think if I may end this on a, on a positive note, we, we can see that some of the member states are increasingly allocating resources to the restoration and management of uh, protected areas. So, but, but more needs to be done and we need to keep the pressure high. Now, um, from the conclusions that I just gave, uh, I think these have been brought very much into the debate on the, on the preparation on the EU biodiversity strategy for 2030. And there's two key elements in the strategy uh, which are of relevance here. The first one is that there is a target uh, to go beyond Natura 2000 and to create a truly coherent trans-European nature network. And you certainly know that some figures have been given. 30% of the land and 30% of the sea area should be protected in the EU. So this is an EU level target. It's not per member state. It's a wider target. It will need some discussion and some agreement on how to achieve this between the member states. And in addition, 10% of the land and sea area should be strictly protected. And that includes all primary and old growth forests. Uh, but the question is, should this only be for, let's say for non-intervention areas or should this also include some areas that are uh, really managed in a targeted way for butterflies, for example, and I know we know very well your position in this respect. And uh, I can only say this is still a moving discussion uh, because the debate is still open on this. And of course, we need to make sure that all the protected areas, not only the Natura 2000 sites, but all of them are then at the latest by 2030 effectively managed and appropriately monitored. And this is also part of the targets of the biodiversity strategy for 2030. The second element is that we do not need just to protect what is there. Uh, in some cases, more needs to be need is needed. And 
we need to restore. Uh, in some cases, we are already at the stage where it's not sufficient to maintain what is there. How is that going to happen? Well, first of all, um, we have a target that we have discussed for the last two years with the member states that uh, is very much based on uh, the logic of the, the nature directives, the birds and habitats directive, and on its reporting, meaning that by 2030, there should be no further deterioration and at least 30% of all species and habitats uh, that are not yet in a good status should by that time at least at the latest show us a measurable positive uh, trend in their conservation status. And we have a, an entire process dedicated to this uh, to make sure that this will happen in the coming years, which is the biogeographic process. And uh, I'm quite sure that we will require your input both when it comes to this 30% restoration target, but also to the, to the protected areas targets where we need some information on key areas to be protected. And we are very much looking forward to a further collaboration with you uh, uh, on these targets. In addition, I should say that um, the commission is also currently preparing a proposal, a legal proposal for a legally binding instrument on restoration targets. Uh, this is much focusing on ecosystems and will also have a strong potential for uh, the conservation of or the restoration of semi-natural habitats. There is, it goes beyond the, the, the scope of a EU nature directives, but how far that is still under discussion for the moment. And it's, I, I think it's still at the brainstorming stage. Uh, and I looking forward that the first proposal will come out uh, in by the commission uh, by the end of this year. Then there are some specific targets uh, uh, in the restoration plan on agricultural land, on pesticides, on uh, having 10% of landscape features uh, um, in the agricultural area. Um, these are very important when it comes to uh, the, the designation of the CAP strategic plan, so the financing of the CAP in the coming years. And we will see, we still need to see to what extent uh, these targets then will, we will able to take them on board, which is also a bit of political question between the Commission and the member states. We have a EU uh, strategy on pollinators, as you know. Um, there is a target in the strategy to decline, to reverse the decline of pollinators. And as you know, the, our EU pollinator strategy is currently under review. So there is also some movement there. And I invite you to follow the discussion up. Before I end, I'd like to say a few words about the new life program, uh, because many of you are potential applicants and there is a lot to do on butterflies. Um, maybe one important element for you is that uh, in the LIFE program, there has been a strong focus so far on the species and habitats that are protected by the nature directives. And now that we have the data on the red listed species, we have a higher potential also to look beyond Natura 2000 on the most threatened species at the EU level. And uh, what I can say is that it is very likely that the co-funding rates for projects targeting these highly threatened species will go up, so it will be more attractive to propose uh, projects for uh, such species. They will also have a higher prioritization level, in particular when there is a link to uh, the biodiversity strategy targets for restoration and for more protected areas. And in addition, there will be a possibility for uh, additional, uh, let's say, dedicated calls, um, uh, such as the ones that we had in the past, uh, with higher co-funding rates, even up to 95% on very specific topics of EU priority importance, for example, on citizen science and monitoring. And we would actually invite you to come up with ideas for such projects. We cannot guarantee that this will be taken up, but in, in fact, uh, there is a possibility to develop on your ideas to develop such specific dedicated calls for projects. So there's a lot to do in the coming years. And I would invite you to, to look very carefully and, and very closely on all, all the evolutions that are ongoing. 
There is no silver bullet. Uh, we will uh, certainly have the same problems at, as we had in the past, uh, but the ambition is high. The biodiversity strategy targets have been endorsed by the member states, so the member states are willing to work on them. Um, and uh, I hope that we will get more progress on this in the coming years, in particular on, on the semi-natural grasslands and the butterflies and other uh, conservation priorities in Europe. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Frank. This was really a very interesting uh, presentation, um, both uh, emphasizing on the problems that we have and the challenges that are there, but also giving some hope for the future. I've got some questions from the audience. And um, uh, the first one is, uh, um, uh, there are many citizens also involved in collecting data and monitoring species and sites. Uh, how are the data that are collected at these monitoring sites flowing to the EU? Does this happen at all? Or is the only information ending up at EU level, the state of nature reports? every six years. Can you please comment on that? Yes, well, first of all, I think it's important to, to highlight that quite a few member states are already using this citizen science data for their reporting under Article 17 and Article 12. So it's not totally disjunct. And, uh, and in fact, it makes the, the accuracy and the, the, level, the detail of information much better. Unfortunately, uh, um, I think this is still restricted to a handful of member states with stronger citizen science movements. And I think the challenge is really to make sure that this spreads to the rest of the EU, which is really difficult. I, I understand that. I'm, I've been following very closely the ABLE project, uh, which succeeded to some extent, but I think there's still more to do. Um, I mean, the, the main... Uh, ways this information is coming to us is in the terms of distribution data huh? um, on the species, but also in, the, in, in terms of trends of distribution. And of course, I think if we talk about the, the common uh, species monitoring schemes, then it is also about, about much more, uh, let's say, general trend information, uh, such as the butterfly grassland indicator. Um, and this is something that we want to promote. I mean, I, I mentioned the birds. There is some very specific uh, information that we can use from the birds uh, portal uh, when it comes to the breeding seasons of birds, very specific to the birds directive. I think that in the future, um, we will need much more information, uh, in, in particular in relation to the protected area targets on the identification of, let's say, key uh, biodiversity areas that are not yet protected and that should be a priority for protection, uh, for example, in the in the frame of a 30% target. And we are very much looking forward to, uh, to the collaboration on these aspects. So identification of key areas for additional protection, identification of areas that needs to be enlarged in priority, uh, identification of key corridors, etc. Thank you very much. Uh, so there is uh, the, the opportunity for all of you uh, to, to try to get all your monitoring data into the, um, the nature reports, the every six year um, Article 17 reporting. That would already help, but that has to take place uh, within the countries, uh, obviously. Another question, we see that uh, in some uh, countries, <clears throat> The policy is now aiming at maintaining habitat types at the poorest possible quality level. And that is obviously within the letter of the legislation, but not the intention. And that is not what we would like to have. Um, is there any movement in policies to correct for this? Well, I would disagree that it's in the letter of a policy because the policy clearly says that the letter of the legislation, yeah, the, the, uh, or the legislation, uh, because the, the, the legislation says that collectively the site should enable the achievement of favorable conservation states. Unfortunately, in the Habitats Directive, there is no deadline for this. So uh, we can only work on the processes 
uh, when it comes to uh, to work, working towards, uh, let's say, achieving that objective. And this is very much about making sure that the sites are uh, appropriately managed. So there is uh, an sufficient resources given to the staff, sufficient resources given to the work on restoration. And, uh, and of course also, and this is uh, indeed a deficit uh, still in, in quite a few member states in the EU, having clear objectives of what you want to achieve with a site and not just looking at the maintain, maintenance of a current a bad uh, status at the local level. And, um, and in fact, we are currently, uh, we are in the course of launching a number of infringement cases where uh, member states are clearly deficient in that respect, where the conservation objectives are not sufficiently well defined. And uh, I mentioned this at the beginning, it's work in progress. Um, so I'm looking forward towards seeing more progress on this. And what we see is that whenever you have an area or region where there is appropriate stuffing and appropriate resources available, uh, it creates a bit of a virtual cycle. And we have really some regions and um, countries in Europe that are much better performing recently on this, where you can see really see a drive towards increased restoration. Uh, but we, we still need to generalize this. And this, uh, this is what we what I, I mentioned when we when it uh, comes to working on the existing um, let's say legislation and the infringement cases. On the other hand, uh, I mentioned the legally binding instrument for restoration targets. Well, that's exactly the purpose of the, of the instrument is that we create a deadline and we create some pressure to, uh, to work towards an, uh, an active improvement, an active restoration of, uh, of the sites um, by basically, uh, yeah, creating legally binding obligations for restoration with a deadline. So this is the novelty of this instrument compared to the, to the current Habitats Directive. Ah, thank you. Yeah, there were also some remarks about uh, really uh, uh, realizing 30% within the restoration targets, which seems to be a dream for the future, and that we re really would like to, um, yeah, to get started working on that. And on the other hand, on um, whether the habitat directive will be suitable in long term given climate change, but uh, given the um, our time frame, um, I would like to push these questions to the breakout rooms, and I hope you will go into discussion about these questions later in the breakout rooms. So uh, now we move on to our next speaker, and Frank already gave uh, quite a nice uh, uh, bridge to that speaker because the next one is David Roy. He is the head of the Biological Center uh, Record Center at CEH in England, in Wallingford, and the UK Center for Ecology and Hydrology. He is deeply involved in uh, the UK butterfly monitoring, and uh, um, he, he was uh, an inspiring uh, project leader of the ABLE project. And in this ABLE project, the work has been done on all of Europe on monitoring. So uh, he really was very talented to get all us uh, stubborn and chaotic scientists to work together on productive results, which is really great. And I'm very much looking forward to, to see your presentation. Please, uh, David, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can you hear me OK and see the screen OK? Yes, I see the screen. Great. Well, thank you very much for that introduction and uh, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be able to um, speak to you about butterfly monitoring and uh, thanks for those kind words. Um, it was a pleasure trying to organize everyone for the ABLE project and really grateful to everyone's support. So I'm going to talk a bit about an update on uh, some aspects. So, sorry, of David, uh, yeah? to start with a, with a chaotic uh, scientist, uh, I forgot to mention that the one uh, um, who is doing the moderation of this uh, presentation is Chris Van Swy, to please address all your questions to Chris Van Swy. And another aspect is if you want to communicate about this meeting in social media, please use the hashtag future future of butterflies uh, all uh, in one word. Thank you, David. It's Thanks. up to you now again. 
Well, Chris is the real expert on this topic, so he can answer lots of difficult questions. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about give an update on uh, monitoring butterflies across Europe. Uh, and I perhaps don't need to say this to this audience in terms of reminding you why, why we want to monitor. Monitoring is clearly one of our central tools for understanding the environment and how we manage resources. And to really unpick what's causing change and then to direct how we how we make interventions in terms of policies, etc. So there's a clear sort of targeted element to monitoring, but also there's a there's a there's the ability to uh, detect unexpected patterns of change, um, ecological surprises, which I think has been true, particularly with long running schemes. The ways we're using the data now of of a very wide, wide ranging in terms of research questions that we, we perhaps weren't even thinking about 30 or 40 years ago. So that's a sort of a really important element of uh, being in this for the long term and having lots of potential reuse of monitoring data. The, the final benefit for me, I think, is particularly around citizen science schemes is is the perhaps off, sometimes overlooked is the, the huge benefit of involving people in the process of collecting the data uh having a, a role in um raising awareness of um ecological issues the scientific process for example and also engaging people in um wildlife and the natural environment to then really care about how it, how it's treated and how we um what we do to to reverse some of the issues so monitoring is incredibly important clearly it's not without cost um citizen science can be hugely cost effective there's, there's very good evidence now that um, looking in the round of sort of benefits of, of monitoring, that there are clear economic benefits for society and research way outstripping the cost of supporting monitoring. This is a nice paper by Tom, Pre, Tom Brees et al. in the context of pollinator monitoring, but that equally applies to butterfly monitoring. So hopefully you're convinced, I'm sure you were already, that we need to monitor. So the way we do this um generally speaking is is used, applying a range of methods some of them listed here so um i'm going to talk in a bit of detail about some of them i'm not really going to say much about capture mark recapture that's incredibly important for uh pop making population estimates i'm really going to focus on the other methods which have the potential to be deployed at large scales for sort of large scale continental scale long-term monitoring so opportunistic uh, sightings or biological records uh, have been, uh, the data go back centuries and, and really growing rapidly in pop popularity. And the, the sort of the main, one of the main benefits of this sort of method is it really makes no, very little conditions on those taking part. It's just a, a record of what was seen at a place at a time and with some supplementary information about who recorded it and other information, for example. So it can involve lots of people, uh, increasingly popular with photographers who want to show off their fantastic pictures. Uh, so a lot of data, a lot of activity, a lot of people, but it really, this sort of loose, loose um, approach to monitoring, it, we end up with a data set that's a real mix of single sightings, um, some complete lists, a range of um, expertise and contributors. Um, so we have to sort of deal with that um, issue of heterogeneity in the data. But the this sort of data is incredibly popular and is, is fantastic for mapping the distribution of species, it underpins our atlases, atlas work, for example, and has given lots of science benefits, particularly understanding the shifting ranges of species um, particularly under climate change, for example. And there are methods to, to unpick the um, heterogeneity and the biases in the data to begin to measure trends in occupancy from this data using occupancy models. Although there's more and more evidence that these um, sorts of trend analysis are perhaps less sensitive to working with count data, not surprisingly. And it's often presence only data we can infer the absences or non-detections, but um, uh, that, that can be difficult in, in some senses. And this map on the right is 
was produced by Chris Van Swy, who pulled together all the uh, relatively accessible opportunistic data across Europe from, from GBIF, including iNaturalists and observation.org, and shows that uh, there's clearly a, a bias in where this data is uh, available. Um, familiar places in the north and west of Europe and other hotspots across Europe. And it's, it's likely there's more data within national systems that perhaps isn't available, but this is um, giving us coverage, reasonable good coverage across Europe, but with clear biases to certain areas. And if we look at how this is changing over time, um, again from Chris, shows that this the availability of the data is, cre is increasing very rapidly. So although there's, a, there's often a lag in the last few years of data becoming available because it needs to be reviewed and then shared, um, a couple of years ago it was almost a million uh, records butterflies contributed through through these sources and I suspect that's that will be even higher over the last two years. What we can also see is the growth in online systems that perhaps get data through the system quicker so observation.org and iNaturalist are two two examples given here but there are other I know there are other systems around Europe that are very active and being used and I think these are going to increase in their popularity um, in the coming years. So the second uh, element of monitoring I want to talk about is um, again should be familiar to many of you is, is butterfly transex. Here's early Ernie Pollard who developed the first methods in um, the, the early 70s and the map of the Monkswood transect that's now been running continuously since 1973. And butterfly and here shows a, a, a transect in Catalonia being walked by Constanti Stefanescu and Butterfly transects are also relatively easy to do, certainly compared to other some other monitoring methods within suitable weather conditions, but ask much more of the uh, person doing the monitoring. So it requires a more regular commitment to visit the sites, um, often weekly, some schemes run on a monthly basis or a two weekly basis. And there's a fixed route. So we know that the counts are from the same place through the season and year on year. And crucially, I think it provides complete lists. So uh, typically it's to, to record or count all butterflies seen on that transect route and therefore ask more of more expertise of contributors. So again, is mostly citizen science based, but requires a higher level of expertise. And the other uh, aspect of butterfly transects is we, we have a lot of ways of dealing with the data, analyzing the data now well established. Uh, methods for assessing population trends, uh, trends in abundance, um, phen phenology metrics, for example. So lots of research has come from this data, um, particularly giving annual indices of relative abundance that's used for national reporting, as we saw some examples for the Netherlands earlier, and to bring be brought together for indicators, again, at national level, but also at European level and has proven to be a very sensitive measure of change, and particularly when you're interested in the condition of a site and how it's changing, because there's a lot of um, regular counts at the same place, you can get a good picture of how the site is changing in response to management, for example. And similarly to opportunistic data, transect recording is growing in popularity within Europe. So the graph on the left shows the in blue the number of transects um, being recorded year on year since 1990. Um, the dark blue is the EU 27 countries and the lighter blue is um, other countries of Europe and the yellow inset figure shows the number of schemes uh, um, uh, op operating monitoring over the same time period. And again, we've seen an increase in the number of countries adopting the, this method um, across Europe. And the map on the right again shows sort of density of effort in this, this time, a, a map of the number of transects within regions. And we see a similar uh, bias towards North and, North and Western Europe in terms of adoption of butterfly monitoring schemes and transects, um, but also, a very active scheme in 
in Switzerland and Catalonia being one of the early schemes and Finland and Sweden also having sort of well-established schemes. Uh, and Germany also um, now monitoring for more than 10 years. But we'll, this figure also shows that we are now starting to expand further through Europe. And as you can see, if you look on the Far East, there's a transit now running in, in uh, Cyprus for the last few years, for example, and schemes starting to be established elsewhere um, further south, such as Italy and Portugal. And this expansion, as uh, Frank mentioned, was, was really stimulated or accelerated through the ABLE project, funded through the European Commission, uh, ran for two years, uh, finished last uh, November, but made huge strides in, in supporting countries and uh, butterfly experts and their partners to develop schemes in a number of new countries in Europe. And ABLE really just provided the, the support in terms of guidance um, shown here is a, a nice identification guide to support recording, uh, which makes the method more accessible um, and also providing tools to be able to capture the data and to analyze the data. So hugely uh, made a huge benefit to monitoring in Europe and we hope to be able to expand on this again um, through some further funding that's uh, under, currently under review with the EU. Because uh, this, this sort of developing experience suggests from countries trying to develop schemes is there needs to be sustained institutional support to really make this possible. You know, it's very cost effective, but there, there, there needs to be national or European level support to um, provide coordination and feedback to volunteers and guidance. But the advantage of bringing together this data um, so we, the other thing we did under the ABLE project is to bring the data into a, a database under a partnership called the EBMS, the European Butterfly Monitoring Scheme Partnership. And bringing this data is to make it more available for research and applications. So if anybody's interested in using this data, this fantastic resource at a European level, please put in a request to the EBMS network um, for your ideas to, to analyze this data. We brought it together under the ABLE project to, to begin to assess trends across Europe for species. So this shows the, the example for the wall, where we can see the uh, index of abundance from different schemes across Europe, some of them illustrated here, broadly showing a similar fluctuations and a similar picture of decline in this species that's now very well reported. Um, but some, some differences emerging between different parts of Europe. So I don't have time to go into those details with alts, um, uh, but we, we are working on um, um, developing those results further um, and developing indicators. So the, the, the indicator that we've, that's been around for longest is the EU grassland indicator that was first brought together in 2005 and is one of the, importantly, is one of the EU's sustainable development goal indicators. So it has, has a real impact at that scale. So I think uh, uh, it adds to all this, the national schemes to be able to contribute to an indicator that use, that's used alongside other uh, environmental indicators for the EU. And this indicator is based on bringing together results for 17 characteristic grassland species, including specialists and, and widespread species into a combined indicator and shows, uh, this is the latest update. Um, Frank showed this earlier, is that unfortunately, uh, reinforcing the, the picture we already know of, of decline in some of these species, an overall decline of 30% um, through this indicator the one on the left shows the indicator for the, the EU 27 countries. And we also produce an indicator including other European countries, non-EU countries to give a wider uh, picture of the status of um, butterflies in Europe, both showing broadly a similar picture of decline since 1990. And the reasons are well documented in terms of intensification of, of land use and land abandonment. Uh, 
and we are and as i said we are working on other indicators uh we produced draft indicators for uh, woodland uh, species and a, a combined indicator across all species where we could produce trends um for the for the european schemes but this illustrates a, a point perhaps to, to highlight in terms of using this data is that although hugely uh, beneficial and successful in monitoring lots of species so there's around 300 butterfly species of europe that have some data through the bms but given the constraints on enough data for the trend analysis we were only produce, able to produce trends for 167 of those species out of the um, total Europe list of 496 species. So about a third of the species, we can produce a trend. And those trends are biased towards the more common and widespread species, so that we have them recorded on enough sites and enough countries. This figure illustrates uh, the number of species for which we can produce trends and the status of that trend against the IUC and red list categories. So most of the species where we have good monitoring data is for those under least concern. So we really want to improve our understanding of the more endangered vulnerable species. So that leads me on to the, so my second part of my toy, talk really is, so we've got these two main methods of transects and sighting data. And if you look at this in the context of number of amount of data and number of people contributing, this triangle of numbers. So we have most data and contributors providing sightings data, incidental records, occasionally complete lists. And we have fewer people and fewer places where we have transects. But we know that transects have a increasing information content in the data that's provided and more um, richer data for trends and um, research. So we have this sort of gap in the middle or, or ideally we'd close this gap between the two approaches. So really, is there a middle way of butterfly monitoring to provide a more balanced view of the status of um, butterfly populations in Europe? So the final thing we were focusing on within ABLE is, is whether we could provide um, tools and approaches to doing this. And this was really following on from the, the, the way that was being led by the UK butterfly conservation and the big butterfly count which was a, an easier method, a 15 minute count, promoted very widely, had great public engagement and publicity from um, David Attenborough, et cetera, which I'm sure certainly helps in terms of getting people interested. And it's more standardized, providing a, a fixed time for the count, provides account information, uh, had wider engagement, so lots, lots of data in lots of places, and was really aimed at the common and widespread species but some work led by Emily Dennish, um, shown here on the figure on the right, shows the trend that has been derived from the big butterfly count. Now it's been running several years, comparing it to trends from the butterfly monitoring scheme, transects over the same time period. And you can see this one, almost one-to-one -one relationship overall showed that the trends from the two sources were broadly very similar. So given this, I think this is quite surprising given the, the sort of diversity of people being involved in the big butterfly count and uh, the diversity of places this was happening. But broadly speaking, it can give us a reasonable picture of trends in common and widespread species. The second sort of aspect of these other methods is what I call area counts or also sometimes with a timed element that have been used for rare and cryptic species or used in lots of contexts for some of the rarer, more restricted species, often used to support Habitats Directive reporting. We've had these methods around a, for a long time. So this is an excuse to show the, the younger selves of two of the eminent butterfly people of Europe. So Jeremy Thomas and Martin Warren both worked on these sorts of methods during their PhDs. And they've now been adopted um, for monitoring um, some of the rare and threatened species, but perhaps they've not been used more widely is, is um, they can be quite technical to, to uh, use in the field and perhaps there wasn't a tool to capture the data more efficiently. So to, to perhaps fill this gap of um, a bit more structure in monitoring 
uh, either through wider engagement such as the big butterfly count or these more um, single species method time count area based methods we've produced or we've developed a, a mobile application called butterfly count to help bridge this gap so really using the technology to lower the barriers to either engagement or collecting this data um, with a clear measure of sampling effort. So based on a 15 minute count where the route is either tracked by the phone GPS or, or providing a tool to enter the area surveyed on the app. So we know both the time monitored and we know the area covered. And the aim is to have a complete list with a count associated. So we this is, see this as potential to fill the gap in underrepresented areas. So urban and farmland where um, perhaps can sometimes be less interesting for volunteers, but having a simple and easy method. And also remote areas where people where it's not suitable for transects because it's not possible to, re to monitor regularly. And also some of our species that are undersampled in terms of rarer species. So that's sort of um, an overview of existing methods. I just want to end by just making two further points about other things to consider in, in monitoring going forward is that I think a future is going to be a range of monitoring methods. We've already got this from sightings and transects and time counts. So there's a diversity of methods. So we need good statistical method models to bring these data together to assess trends and produce models of distributions to integrate the data. And some clever statistical quantitative people are starting to focus on this, this issue. And I think we'll make, or they will make big developments in this area in the next five, five years or so. Quite challenging statistically, but uh, clearly an important direction of travel. The second area I think is starting to grow rapidly is the use of technology to support monitoring in some scenarios. So um, these insect camera traps using deep learning computer vision to monitor um, and detect species more automatically. So to summarize, so I think biodiversity monitoring is hugely valuable for research and conservation. It's proven that in many contexts and is a vital part of the puzzle to, to really address our growing concern of insect declines or growing awareness of insect declines. Butterflies are one of the insect groups most feasible to monitor well-developed proven methods and will be really important for developing and delivering delivering the EU, EU pollinator initiative and EU pollinator monitoring. Citizen science is hugely cost effective but does need some support um, but has the added benefit of engaging volunteers. This 15 minute count method we think is really important for bridging the gap between transects and sightings data and the future will I believe will be a, a hybrid approach of professionals and volunteers, blend of methods and models to deal with the data and making increasing use, efficient use of technology. So I'd just like to thank um, all the butterfly coordinators and volunteers and those who've given us huge support for ABLE, the ABLE project, the ABLE team, the EU for funding ABLE and particularly uh, Vlinder Stichting for organizing this conference. And thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, David, for this uh, very interesting uh, uh, presentation. Um, just uh, uh, going on, it's always really nice to see how this ABLE project is being uh, told to everyone that we can promote it everywhere and show that everyone really can participate in monitoring butterflies in Europe. A question about that. Is setting up butterfly monitoring schemes in more species rich regions more complicated because of uh, more expertise, species knowledge is needed for counting butterflies. Can you comment on that question, please? Uh, yes, yeah, it is can be challenging. Uh, so I think it is challenging, but it's been proven, I think, through, through the experience in Catalonia and uh, new schemes in Italy, for example, which are covering some very diverse places that it is possible. And I think, uh, but needs support in terms of training, guidance material um, to support contributors. And I think a good way to start is, you know, if, if, if people start early in the season, then you gain familiar, fam familiarity of species before the real diversity starts to, um, 
yeah. um, occur through the season. So it is possible, it is challenging, but um, and therefore clearly needs some support for volunteers. Yeah, thank you. And I would like to add that it is all really very rewarding if in the end you find out that you're really a helpful participant in a method where the results are really being used, even up to European policy. And that makes it really rewarding um, doing monitoring transact or 50 minute counts. Thank you very much. We are now uh, starting uh, the first uh, break. The first challenge on uh, moving to breakout rooms, we have uh, um, opened uh, several uh, uh, breakout rooms for several themes. Um, I would like to ask the speakers to find one with their theme and there continue the discussion about their presentation. And the other ones uh, will be just open for everyone. The symbol is now available. So you can just pick your breakout room and we will meet again over half an hour at 11.30 to go on with the presentation of Thomas Hartmann. Please enjoy the break and see you soon uh, later. Grassland one habitat patch, it's a larger patch and this patch is still grazed by sheep. And we had an another patch, it's smaller and it's an abandoned um, one with a lot of shrubs and uh, poorer habitat quality than this one. And between both patches, we have a matrix. Uh, often this matrix is, uh, um, consists of arable fields. And here is another matrix. And that's how our landscapes look like. We have today, we have often fragmented landscapes where we have habitat patches of different size and different quality. And between them, we have a matrix uh, um, where it's quite hard for many of the butterfly species to um, live um, or even to, to move through these landscapes. Um, the key drivers of butterfly persistence in our fragmented landscapes are habitat quality, habitat size, and habitat connecti connectivity. During the last decades, there were several studies that showed that these three um, parameters are the main drivers of butterfly persistence, and all three have changed. Uh, usually, we have a loss of habitat quality in our patches due to and uh, abandonment on the other hand. Um, and additionally, we have nitrogen deposition that affects all of our landscapes. Habitat size also declined. Most of our habitat patches are today smaller than a few decades ago. And the same is true for habitat connectivity. We have a loss, had a loss of habitat co um, connectivity in our landscapes. Now I'd like to focus on habitat quality. What determines habitat quality in our habitat patches? We met a lot of studies in calcareous grasslands in central Germany. Yema already mentioned the Diemel Valley in central Germany, where we did a lot of our research. And we um, um, focused in one research on these ant hills of the yellow meadow ant, Lasius flavus, and the ant species builds the, the ant hills because it's needs a warm microclimate for successful development of um, the brood. And we made microclimatic measurements on these hills, on top of these hills, and we see we had significantly higher temperatures uh, on the surface of the ant hills compared to the matrix vegetation. Um, some like it hot. There are a lot of insects that like it hot, and that's true for this ant. And it's also true for a lot of butterfly species. A warm microclimate um, is uh, of, uh, yeah, of high importance for a lot of butterfly species. And uh, 
we studied the occupancy of ant hills with the occurrence of the host plant of Festuca ovina. Um, and we compared this with the matrix vegetation and we observed a significantly higher occupancy on the ant hills compared to the matrix. Yeah, many butterfly species like it hot, warm microclimates uh, of uh, crucial importance for a lot of our species. What's about um, plant species richness, plant uh, species diversity in our landscapes? Here we studied uh, again calcareous grasslands, but now in southern Germany, and we focused on habitat specialists. And we saw a clear relationship between the number of host plants on a patch and the number of habitat specialist butterflies in these calcareous grasslands. Yeah, if we have a lot of plant species, we usually have also a lot of butterfly species. And to get that uh, such uh, species rich habitats, uh, we need, um, or the plant species it's rich habitats, we need nutrient poor conditions and low land use in intensity both are quite important for plant species richness in our habitats. Here we have an impression of such a calcareous grasslands during the flowering pe period of Phytoma orbiculare. Um, such grasslands are hotspots uh, not only for plant diversity but also for butterfly diversity. Um, a thing um, um, where we have only a few studies is host plant quality. And today we heard a lot of things about nitrogen deposition and uh, fertilization of habitats. And we made a study with several butterfly and moss species, a fertilization experiment. And um, one species we focused on was Lucena titirus, uh, still widespread species across Europe, but a declining species especially in, in central and, and uh, yeah, those, those western parts of uh, continental Europe. And uh, in our experiment, we saw a decreasing survival rate um, of the larvae with uh, nitrogen fertilization. And already at 30 kilograms per hectare and year, we had a decrease in the survival rates and at higher fertilization um, quantities, uh, yeah, we had a, some clearly much stronger effect of uh, negative effect of fertilization. So habitat quality also matters and most of all our butterfly species are adapted to nutrient poor conditions for centuries, for, for, uh, for thousands of years, and uh, they are not able to cope with uh, too much nitrogen in their within their food. Yeah, junk food is anything but healthy for this species. And it can be assumed that that's the same for a lot of species that were originally adapted to nutrient poor conditions. Let's talk about habitat size. Uh, um, what what size is required by, by the species. And this species, the Niobe fritillary agonis niobe, was formerly um, quite widespread species in Germany. It occurred in all German federal states uh, 100 years ago, ago. Today, there are only three strongholds in Germany. These are the East Frisian Islands the southern spurs of the Black Forest and the Bavarian Alps. Um, all populations here in Eastern Germany, especially in Brandenburg, um, have, be, have become extinct uh, during the last 20 years. And I will talk later, later on this, what are the reasons for the loss of uh, um, the species in these areas. But in the three hotspots, we have still strong populations. and. We conducted detailed studies on the East Frisian Islands and we detected that, that uh, all the gray dunes are potential larval habitats for the species. 
um, they are characterized by a high cover of host plants of violets, viola canina, and uh, um, then we had a look on all the islands in the southern North Sea, North Sea from the Netherlands to Denmark, and we looked at the occurrence of gray dunes, of the size of gray dunes on the islands, and uh, what we detected was that the species only occurred on islands with 100 hectare of um, gray dune vegetation with violets, and where the area of gray dunes was smaller than 100 hectare, um, the species did not occur. So there are butterfly species that have really huge area requirements, and that is true for this species. And when we see this, it becomes clear why the species is today so rare. 100 years ago, we had large areas of nutrient-poor grassland rich in violets, and today um, there are only a few areas have remained. Here we see how these dunes may look like. We have a mosaic of gray dunes and brown dunes, and these areas are quite large um, on the occupied islands, and they are heterogeneous. And uh, the former populations in eastern Germany that have become extinct, they occurred in relatively homogeneous um, sand, sand grasslands or um, heathlands, and very likely that was the reason why the species became extinct during the last 20 years, um, because these homogeneous habitats were more, were more affected by um, the drought events of the last years and uh, the host plants uh, desiccated in the whole habitat. And um, here, heterogeneity is a quite good buffer against climatic extreme events. We have def different aspects and uh, some violets, uh, um, yeah, it is very likely that some violets um, survive even in relatively dry summers in these dunes. Um, we saw that um, the um, habitat patches are surrounded by a matrix and in Germany and in large parts of Central Europe, these, this, uh, the matrix often consists of arable land in Germany 36% of the land surface is covered by arable land. And we um, studied this butterfly also in central Germany in nutrient poor grasslands, um, the woodland ringlet, Erebia medusa, and uh, grassland patches that were surrounded by a high cover of arable land uh, in these patches. Um, the species rarely occurred, and uh, especially arable, uh, the matrix, um, arable land as the matrix has strong negative effects on butterflies um, with a higher mobility that uh, move from one patch to another patch. And uh, yeah, species that are more restricted to the habitat patches, there we didn't see an effect of the arable land. Uh, in the surrounding, but in this more mobile species, there was a clear effect, negative effect of um, the matrix arable land. Climate change, we also heard a lot of things today on, on climate change and uh, we focused on winter climate. And again, we made studies on the woodland ringlet. We made climatic chamber experiments and uh, we had three winter treatments, a cold treatment, um, which, which is characteristic for stable populations in mountain areas in Germany and a moderate climate uh, we can find in some mountain areas where the populations are declining and a warm winter climate, which is suspected to occur in future uh, in Germany and parts of the German mountain ranges due to to climate warming. And we see a clear negative effect of warmer winters for this species. And uh, yeah, it can be assumed that there are several mountain species 
that suffer from such warm climates. And another one uh, that also suffers from um, global warming from warm winters is this species. It's the violet Topa Lucena helle. Um, here we conducted a study in, in Western Germany in the Eiffel low mountain range. And the, the habitats that were occupied, they were characterized during winter by cooler temperatures um, compared to unoccupied habitat patches. And that was true for during daytime and also during nighttime. And here we see it uh, during the, the whole day, um, how um, the temperatures differed. Um, this species is clearly adapted um, to areas where we have uh, cool conditions in winter. Cold air depressions are of um, high importance for this species. And uh, yeah, and um, so the species is clearly threatened by global warming. Cold winters are important for this species. In areas where a lot of um, habitats have gone, have been destroyed, restoration can be a possibility to, um, to, yeah, to create new habitats and uh, to increase the, the likelihood of long-term survival of butterfly species. This species, the blue spot hair streak, um, usually occurs in calcareous grasslands. And we compared um, formerly abandoned calcareous grasslands where the shrubs had been cut um, with regularly grazed pastures and abandoned calcareous grasslands. And we see that shrub cutting resulted in significantly higher um, plant density, host plant densities. The host plant is Ramnus catartica, a, um, a shrub. And uh, yeah, and um, the effect of shrub cutting of habitat restoration was even stronger for the egg batches of Saturum spini in um, these restored, restored calcareous grasslands. We had significantly higher densities of the batches compared to abandoned grasslands and the pastures at an intermediate um, position. So um, yeah, rest restoration of habitats is possible, possible. And if we have source populations in the surrounding species can um, rapidly respond, respond to the measures that have been conducted. Um, yeah, the persistence of butterflies in fragmented landscapes de um, depends on networks of large and well-connected habitat patches of high habitat quality. The drivers of decline are land use change, climate change, and also nitrogen deposition. One thing I, I didn't talk about is the extinction depth. Um, um, we have often an too optimistic view on oil landscapes. We see a lot of species and think everything is, is good, but uh, there are several studies that recently showed that um, we have an extinction depth, a time, time, time delayed extinction, and this has also been shown for butterflies. So we have um, this, uh, have, uh, have to consider about the extinction depth uh, it will also affect uh, our species. Habitat heterogeneity is quite important in these times. Here we see such a heterogeneous sand grassland in northwestern Germany. Habitat heterogeneity is often interrelated with habitat quality. Heterogeneous habitats um, yeah, usually have at least some parts with a high um, habitat quality for certain species. And these um, heterogeneous habitats are often a useful buffer against climatic extreme events, especially in times of climate change. Habitat heterogeneity is quite important. When we talk about conservation measures, um, we should 
first focused on heterogeneous high quality habitats and uh, yeah to um, um, reach high quality within the habitats often traditional forms of land use like low intensity grazing or traditional woodland management um, forms like um, coppicing or so are often very useful um, um, in wet habitats, stabilization of the water level is um, today quite important. In mountain areas, um, we should also focus on cold air depressions um, to manage these areas quite well. And uh, where a lot of habitats have been lost, the restoration of habitats and habitat net networks can be um, useful, especially along elevational gradients in mountain areas so that the species are able to track global warming. And uh, yeah, with this uh, slide of uh, Apollo butterfly, the species that also um, suffered from the abandonment of traditional grazing and requires warm microhabitats, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Thomas, for your interesting presentation. I think uh, it's time for me to go back to Dimmertal again and see it now. I have some questions. Um, the, the idea um, that you propose that uh, some butterflies like it hot um, about uh, these anthills of the yellow meadow ant uh, apparently got some interest. Um, do you know whether there is a point that these, uh, um, the surface of these meadow ants that get hot and are now delivering a profitable uh, microclimate might get too hot from climate change and then there is a negative effect associated to that? Yeah, uh, during recent years, there were some patches where um, um, the, the, the meadow ants uh, um, left their 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 ant hills because they have become too hot and uh, yeah that's possible yeah okay thank you please, Thomas, could, you, could you please uh, stop screen screen scaring thank you oh yeah yeah another question uh, uh, also about these ant hills is uh, that uh, um, uh, they they might help because uh, uh, the ants bring up fresh air all the time from below the ant hills. Uh, so therefore, um, they might compensate for the excess in nitrogen deposition. Yeah, may, may, it might be true, yeah. It's a nice hypothesis to work on in the future. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you, Thomas. <laughs> Let's move on to our last speaker, Joost Vogels. The moderator uh, for the questions during this presentation is Michiel. Um, Jos Vogels is a senior ecologist uh, at the uh, NGO Varga Foundation, and he's a specialist in restoration ecology. He studies uh, the effects of resource quality and nutrient cycling on uh, threatened organisms, aiming on effective nature conservation measurements. So he can make the link from the molecules in the soil and the plants to the well-being or not of the butterflies. Please, uh, Joost, uh, um, uh, the floor is yours now. Just, are you still I have muted? to unmute myself, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Here I am. Um, thank you, Emma. Um, yeah, nitrogen deposition and butterflies. Um, I was asked to uh, uh, present my uh, uh, recent work on it. Um, I will try to give an overview of what do we know in general in, in, uh, 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 in science and what can we expect when this nitrogen deposition will alter uh, nutrient quality of plants. But actually, I'm not really a butterfly specialist, so I was really honored to do to give a talk on a butterfly symposium. Um, it's basically my work is focused on on a much broader scale, nitrogen deposition in invertebrates. Um, 
But then again, I will probably lose the interest of most of the audience. So I try to focus more on butterflies as a special case um, with respect to nitrogen, nitrogen deposition and um, uh, host plant quality, because I think that really are a bit of a special case in uh, um, uh, with respect to nitrogen deposition. For nitrogen deposition and the effects on, on, on invertebrates, it's actually, you can think of it as, as a paradox because when you have an increased nitrogen deposition, it's uh, pretty well known that autotroph CN ratio uh, will decrease. Um, here, uh, a famous paper from, uh, 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 from Elser, who uh, pictured CN ratio of autotrophs uh, 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 and compared it with herbivores. And now you can see that most autotroph CN ratio can, have, can be much higher than what herbivore CN ratio is. So in general, nitrogen is a limiting element for the growth of uh, most herbivores. So if you have an increase of nitrogen and a, a, a consequent decrease in CN ratio, you would expect an increase in herbivore biomass, abundance, performance, fitness, um, prey items for birds, Etc. Um, but that's actually not what we see, at least not in the Netherlands. This is a, a, a report uh, from the um, uh, Living Planet Index, with, in which they index heathland fauna species and compared it with a high nitrogen load, uh, uh, with a very high nitrogen load. Why not a low nitrogen load? We don't have low nitrogen deposition uh, areas in the Netherlands. And then we can see that the decrease of uh, or the general trend decrease uh, uh, is uh, negative in every area, but the general trend decreases further and, and quicker in high nitrogen deposition areas. Um, if you want to disentangle the effects of nitrogen deposition, um, you already come up with a quite a uh, complicated figure. Um, this has been uh, work done by my colleague, Marijn Nijssen, uh, published in Biological Conservation. Um, we gave an, an overview of all different pathways involved in uh, uh, invertebrate response to increased nitrogen deposition. Uh, many of those have already been uh, addressed by Thomas Vaartman, so we can have a lot of host plant species. Microclimate will be uh, influenced. Uh, uh, key habitat features will be, uh, could, could be lost. Um, changes in, in availability of nutritional key species, for instance, invertebrate prey for a higher for, uh, order of uh, fauna. Um, but also food plant quality can be altered as a result of nitrogen deposition. Um, but then again, food plant quality is also quite a container uh, um, um, idea and the way but first, you need to know how do we define food plant quality. Um, in order to disentangle these uh, um, uh, these things, uh, uh, we wrote a review report for a, a, a Dutch uh, knowledge network, OBN. And at first, we just focused on a review of different nutritional frameworks that exist in ecology. And I will focus on three out of five because I don't have uh, the time to, to address them all, uh, which is ecological stoichiometry. Uh, much work has been done on that in the, in the last 20 years. Nutritional geometry is this work that's focused on, on uh, nutrient selection and ionomics, which is actually an extension of ecological stoichiometry, uh, focusing on other elements than just the usual, uh, the usual nitrogen, phosphorus and, uh, and carbon. And another question, of course, is how does nitrogen deposition affect these nutritional quality in all these frameworks and in which direction? And can we make predictions on what it, what it will mean for, uh, uh, for herbivores or for uh, uh, butterflies in particular? From the same paper of Elser uh, um, in ecological stoichiometry, you also noted that nitrogen to phosphorus ratio uh, uh, also differs between autotroph and herbivores. And there still is also in MP ratio, a mismatch in the ratios 
of nitrogen to phosphorus versus herbivores with herbivores having in general a lower nitrogen to phosphorus ratio than the autotrophs have. So herbivores are not only limited by nitrogen supply, but generally also by phosphorus supply, although the, uh, the degree of limitation is often lower. But if you have an increase of nitrogen and a further decrease in CN ratio, um, what we, we also see is that the nitrogen to phosphorus ratio uh, increases in response to that because we just have more nitrogen and less phosphorus. So this could mean that we are gradually going from a shift to nitrogen limitation in, in our pharma to a more prone shift to phosphorus limitation. Um, why I think that butterflies are a special case in, in, in this uh, is exemplified by uh, two papers from, uh, from quite, a, quite a, a while ago in which they just focused on what's the percentage nitrogen in different uh, orders of, uh, of invertebrates and what's the percentage of phosphorus in invertebrates. And in the first paper, they just lumped uh, Diptera and Lepidoptera together into the bigger group Panopida, but well, we know they're mostly herbivore. Uh, 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 so this is the nitrogen percentage in, in uh, mostly butterflies and herbivorous Diptera. And with phosphorus, you can actually see that Lepidoptera are in the higher end of phosphorus. So they are in the lower spectrum of nitrogen and in the higher spectrum of phosphorus, which means that the N to P ratio of these species generally is rather low. Um, and this is also something that can be imagined logically because uh, both Diptera and uh, um, uh, uh, Lepidoptera butterflies, they have a full metamorphosis, which means that in the larval stage, they really need to uh, reallocate a lot of nutrients. And if you want to reallocate nitrogen into different proteins, you need a lot of ribosomes and ribosomal RNA is the major pool of phosphorus. So every species that needs to grow fast or need to reallocate a lot of, uh, um, um, of protein is prone to have a relatively high phosphorus content because you need the machinery in order to, uh, um, to do so. Um, do we see this in these kinds of shifts in, in the field? Well, there is some, uh, some evidence uh, from my own work. This is the prey availability for black grouts at the, the, the last population in the Netherlands, the Salanse Heuvelrug, um, which I just collected invertebrates and look at biomass of these invertebrates in relation to nitrogen and phosphorus in Kalina vulgaris shoots. And here you can see that under the lower end of nitrogen, um, an increase in phosphorus means an increase in biomass. And I can tell you most of biomass is made, made out by caterpillars in these, uh, in these graphs. While at the higher end of nitrogen, you see that there is generally a lower biomass and you don't see this increase anymore. So it seems that in our heathland areas, uh, uh, these but, uh, butterflies are probably um, caterpillars are more phosphorus limited than they are nitrogen limited. And of course, we have uh, a very high degree of uh, nitrogen deposition. Uh, having 1.3% of nitrogen in Colunda vulgaris is, is really at the higher end. And in low nitrogen deposition levels, we can actually find uh, nitrogen levels of uh, 0.8 to 1% at max. So this would be at the, at the better end. Um, another very important aspect of ecological stoichiometry, stoichiometry thinking is that there is some kind of threshold elemental ratio that you need uh, uh, to focus on is that it, it's, it is never a continuous, continuously going better if an element is increasing because it's always dependent on uh, the requirements uh, related to other elements. So here for uh, uh, Aquatic fauna, uh, diet carbon to phosphorus ratio has been uh, linked to somatic growth rate. And you can see there is a, an optimum at a certain ratio. And you can see this as, as a species specific optimal ratio. <clears throat> and it probably 
relates to uh, uh, the requirements of different elements. Um, we try to find uh, if there was some kind of general entropy ratio range in these uh, for many invertebrates. Uh, I looked at a lot of p-addition effect studies, studies, and we saw an increase in fitness as the the, the MP ratio, which they start started out with, were, was already high. So then they would really lower uh, uh, the N2P ratio, um, and it actually decreased uh, <clears throat> if the N2P ratio was already low to begin with, with some mixed results in between. So there's also quite a you know, at, at least it gives some evidence that there is this uh, quadratic relationships in NP ratio uh, for food plants of, of invertebrates as well. If you want to put this in a broader context, you can also think of it as having a different nutritional niches between species. Um, here I have uh, uh, made, made a picture of a producer nitrogen to phosphorus ratio, uh, consumer fitness, based on this threshold elemental ratio uh, theory and see specialist feeders as a homeostatic uh, species, which is adapted to a more narrow uh, uh, predictable resource ratio niche uh, in contrast to generalist feeders who are probably adapted to a much more broad niche. And if you have a nitrogen deposition driving producer MP ratio to a higher level then the specialist uh, will suffer a higher uh, fitness cost than the generalist does because it's much more adapted to a broader niche. So we can also put in, try to diverge between species based on niche uh, and on a nutritional niche, of, of course. Um, another important aspect is fast versus slow development. If you have already mentioned that if you have a higher relatively for higher relative growth rates, you need more ribosomes for high protein synthesis, and you are probably have a low internal nitrogen to phosphorus ratio, and uh, you're more vulnerable to the change producer MP ratio than you have a slow de developing species. And here in just a hypothetical example, you can have an increase of a slow developer species because it still benefits from higher nitrogen levels, but a decrease in the fast development uh, developer species because it's uh, uh, getting away from its threshold elemental ratio. So another hypothesis we can test or are hopefully to be tested that fast growing species are more prone to negative effects than slow growing species. Um, well, of course, this all, all it all depends also on the threshold elemental ratio of C versus M on CN ratio. Uh, to further complicate this, we really know that insects are very good in regulating nutrient intake. A lot of work is being done on that in the geometric framework in which they uh, did a lot of experiments with, uh, with insects, offering them food differing in protein and carbohydrate content. And uh, if you, uh, in, in, in this uh, graph, they offer two types of food, uh, one in high protein, uh, levels low in carbohydrate and the other one uh, just complementary. And if uh, uh, an animal is, is being offered two foods, it first starts to eat this and then it, it measures internally a, a low protein content. So then it will, will select high protein content and it eats to such a way that it reaches its optimum intake target. If you don't have any choice, then well, you cannot really reach the intake target. And then you can do at least three things. You can just overeat an excess nutrient, but then suffer the fitness costs of eating too much nutrients. You can just stop completely and, and, and uh, uh, do not overeat at all, or you can just find some, uh, uh, some compromise uh, in between and suffer some uh, fitness cost. Um, so they are really good at regulating nutrient intake, uh, at least for protein and carbohydrate. But note that it only applies to protein and carbohydrate and probably not for phosphorus. Um, between species, these intake targets can differ widely. This is a, a, a 
study bait uh, uh, on uh, on Nebraska grasshoppers, in which they found that most grasshoppers have quite distinct intake targets, which means that if if something changes in in in, uh, in nutrient quality, some species might benefit, others might suffer. Um, And insects are known to compensate food intake for nitrogen and carbon, or at least for protein and carbohydrates. But for phosphorus, a lot of research, not a lot of research has been done, but if they do research on it, they don't really find evidence for intake regulation for phosphorus. Here, an example of, uh, uh, from a grasshopper where they, they increased grass nitrogen supply. Uh, in the plant, and they obviously selected high nitrogen grass. And here, in which they differed in phosphorus uh, diets and, and looked at how, how much of this diet has been eaten, and they, sh they show no uh, response to low or high phosphorus levels, even if they will, they found negative effects of very low phosphorus percentages in diet. So this, this species is is obviously uh, um, uh, limited by phosphorus, but it's probably not able to tell whether there's a high or low phosphorus level present in its food. And that can be a problem because if, if, if an animal uh, is just assuming that a high protein level is, is accompanied by a high phosphorus level, and we are selecting for, uh, for an intake target for nitrogen, if your nitrogen increases and your phosphorus remains the same, well, we just eat less, which means even less phosphorus intake, which can exacerbate this changes in nitrogen to phosphorus content. So look, let's look a little bit more deeper into the food specialist versus generalists uh, hypothesis. And uh, you can consider food specialists as a, well, a species that bets on a single horse versus a mobile versus the generalist. Uh, especially mobile generalist as a species that's betting on many horses, so a risk spread of versus uh, a high adaptation uh, specialist. Um, so these specialists have a high degree of host plant specialization and often grass or herb feeders. They selected often within host plants, uh, nutrient rich uh, plant parts. Uh, they probably have a more of a strong stronger intake homeostasis. So they probably avoid eating too much ex excess nutrient because they won't find any complementary food anyhow. Um, and they often also show a low dispersal ability. So it's energy saving, but there's also a low chance of encountering complement complementary food. And the, these mobile generalists are actually the other end of the spectrum. Uh, uh, so, most, most of these traits are just diverged uh, the other way around. Um, and one could imagine that concerning nitrogen deposition, uh, that these generalists were probably much more prone to, to benefit from a higher nitrogen content, and that these food specialists are probably much more prone to, uh, uh, to suffer negative effects. Um, and we did some preliminary uh, research on that, uh, together with uh, Michiel Wallace de Vries and Chris van Swaai, and looked at the uh, trends of, of specialists of oligotrophic habitats, uh, which are really uh, uh, host plant specialists, and general, more generalist also in oligotrophic uh, habitats, um, feeding on mostly on woody plant species, and looked at uh, again, within the Netherlands, uh, uh, between low and high nitrogen deposition regions. So this is a high nitrogen deposition, cumulative nitrogen deposition over 20 years, more than 2,500 moles per hectare per year or per hectare over these years. And this is the lower end. And uh, well, we see declining uh, uh, populations as well, but for these specialist species, these trends are generally higher in the high nitrogen deposition areas. While for these more generalists, we don't see these trends. So there is preliminarily some truth, some truth to that, but we really need to look into it much to much deeper detail, of course. So until now, I only talked about carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. Um, the question 
actually is, is this justified? So the usual suspects, and most of the research, I think 99% of all research is being done on carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. Um, but animals need much more than only carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. And this is a famous uh, uh, paper on Nebraska grasshoppers again, um, in which they checked uh, uh, trace metal concentration in, uh, in, in, in food plant species, whether they actually had some predictive power in, uh, um, uh, in explaining the densities of, of, uh, of, of herbivores. And there are a lot of trace metals involved in these uh, actually explaining densities of, uh, uh, of herbs of grass feeders, fork feeders, and mixed feeders next to nitrogen and phosphorus. So it's not only nitrogen, carbon, and phosphorus. Probably a lot of other elements and elemental concentration are important as well in, in, if you want to really determine food quality for, uh, uh, for herbivores. Um, and nitrogen deposition also affects these elements, because nitrogen not only increases nitrogen in plants, but it also has the, uh, uh, the problematic ability to, uh, to increase acidification rates. And with increased acidification rates, you get leaching of a lot of elements. And subsequently, these elements in host plants also tend to decline under nitrogen deposition. This is uh, data from a beach in calcareous versus acidic soil in, uh, in Germany. And at the higher nitrogen deposition uh, or higher added nitrogen, we see a general decreasing trend, not only uh, in, in phosphorus, but also in elements like magnesium and potassium. And probably a lot of other elements also, uh, uh, also will generally decrease because of leaching of these elements. Um, and these trace metals, they play a plethora of, of roles. Um, actually, two main roles in trace metals are, are, are important for, uh, uh, for herbivores. First of all, they are used in particular hardening. So if you have a mandible from a, 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 from a species that it's adapted to some tough grass, uh, you can better bet, you bet on it that it has extra levels of zinc, manganese, Sil uh, silica in its mandibles in order to cope with it. So if you have a, a reduction of these elements, um, that might pose a problem for these, uh, uh, for these species to, to be able to, to digest food. And of course, another uh, important role for all these trace metals is the active, active sites in many enzymes. I here I put a, a table of, uh, of a lot of enzymes uh, with metals in it, if you really have, uh, have a limitation of a certain metal at a certain point, uh, the activity of these enzymes will, uh, will be reduced, which can also re lead to reduced fitness in these uh, uh, species. Um, this is a field in which, which is just starting out. And there's much to learn in the field of ionomic relationships in ecology. Uh, until now, the most references to ionomics are actually to birds and calcium in literature and focused on, uh, uh, on eggshell thickness. If you try to find something about invertebrates, you'll end up with maybe 10 papers at max. So to conclude or for some take home messages, um, I hope I, I made clear that more nitrogen is not always better. Uh, that Thomas Farman also pointed this out, but note that for specific species groups, it will probably uh, be better. Um, and I would imagine that for, uh, for these generalist species that they tend to increase, maybe also in populations and in biomass. But if you look at the broader, broader grand scheme of things, a lot of species will uh, show no or a positive uh, uh, effect, but a lot of species will also show uh, negative responses. And that could explain why we see a general decline in, in species richness under high nitrogen deposition loads, or at least for in, in part. Um, I also explained that the effects of nitrogen deposition on plant nutrition for species is really environment and species specific. So 
So species traits, life history, and specialism are all important determinants of a species specific response to increased nitrogen in, uh, in, in plants or decreased uh, other elements. Uh, probably host plants that grow on a naturally oligotrophic environment are most prone to big changes in elemental composition on the nitrogen deposition. It's not only nitrogen, but on a naturally oligotrophic environment, there are also, uh, they tend to be most vulnerable to acidification as well. So they, these changes will probably also be more pronounced than in less uh, uh, oligotrophic environments. And we need fundamental knowledge on how insects regulate nutrient intake and how uh, um, nutrient function in, in insect physiology in order to find out how the exact working mechanisms are. And if we combine these three main parts, uh, um, I hope to put up some testable hypothesis that predict species response to uh, increase nitrogen deposition. And if we have these, these hypotheses, then we can test them in the field. And if we do this, the major benefit is that we don't just look at what is, what is happening, but we can predict what is happening uh, based on detailed species specific knowledge. And if we can predict what is happening, we can also uh, uh, put out to policy makers and explain why it's very important to reduce nitrogen deposition or reduce nitrogen emissions rather than just trying to remove nitrogen from, uh, from these habitats. So let's get up, start testing, go out in the field, and um, I thank you for listening. Thank you, Joost. Great idea, go up in the field and work. Um, but first, some questions, please. Um, uh, one of the questions is um, <clears throat> whether um, end deposition in all cases leads to higher plant tissue and concentrations. Um, uh, just when you think of uh, plants being unlimited, um, there will be a growth response. So they take up more N, but grow. And could that lead to dilution of the N amount uh, taken up in the end? Um, yes, yeah, it's, it's possible. And generally, this in, in general, nitrogen content will 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 be all, also always increased, but in part you get dilution effects. Um, but most of the nitrogen is being put into uh, um, into into protein. Most most of course into uh, um, um, into chlorophyll. Uh, so nitrogen content in in really nitrogen limited plants will will always increase to such an extent, and they can invest it more into growth. Um, but if this if this happens, all the other elements will dilute much more than nitrogen will. So if you have no response in CN ratio whatsoever, if if your nitrogen increased and 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 is being put into growth, um, it's safe to assume that for for instance, MP ratio will increase much for, much further than that. So there's probably a, a bit of a dilution effect. In, in reality, you always see uh, uh, increases uh, of nitrogen and decreases in CN ratio. That's, uh, um, I refer to that in my talk. Uh, it's being reviewed quite extensively and most papers find uh, decreased CN ratios as a result of nitrogen deposition effect. So, so in the end, it will be the critical elements um, that will be diluted and that will end up in a problem for the organisms. If these elements are uh, limiting for, for these organisms, you can have dilution, growth dilution, but also leaching uh, related dilution that uh, uh, will be responsible. But also did not mention uh, the fact that uh, nitrogen and protein are still a proxy uh, it, it's also very important what kind of amino acids are being produced by plants. Yeah, yeah. And so you can also have, uh, it's known that if you have a high level, high degree of nitrogen, that plants tend to metabolize high N amino acids more than low N amino acids. And for a lot of um, organisms, there, there are many amino acids that are, are in fact essential, they cannot metabolize themselves. So if we have 
um, a dilution of low N essential amino acids, which can also be uh, uh, important in determining food quality. Uh, well, okay. Uh, um, the next question is um, uh, now um, I'm, I'm um, aiming on your knowledge uh, with respect to restoration measures. And the question is whether you uh, could use changes in grazing regimes to enhance or to mitigate uh, end deposition. Um, I think in part it is possible, but also uh, at least for heathlands, is be, uh, uh, there is a paper that that states that if you do, if you intensify grazing, you also remove nutrients and you. With, with with continuous nitrogen deposition, nitrogen is being replenished more uh, more easily than other nutrients. Uh, so even with grazing, you tend to have a shift from uh, nitrogen limit, lim limitation towards phosphorus limitation because phosphorus is being uh, being removed to a higher extent. And grazing is actually the the least uh, uh, actually the least impact on these elements. In Ethan, for instance, salt cutting has a huge impact on phosphorus uh, uh, um, uh, in, in, in these systems. And you can actually see a clear shift from nitrogen to phosphorus limitation in these heathlands. And this is probably the reason why Colune vulgaris is, 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 is responding good to salt cutting because it, it's very able to, to scavenge the little phosphorus that is left. Um, so every management that focuses on removing nitrogen, the, it also removes other elements. And yeah. grazing is the least uh, it's the least impact, but it still has an impact. So in the long term, you 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 will end up with a um, with a stronger phosphorus limited ecosystem. Thank you. Uh, I see the same experiences in grasslands with the sub cutting. So. Uh, but it's nice to continue this uh, discussion further in the breakout rooms, because now we have our lunch break and uh, Cass will open the breakout rooms again. So uh, you can choose uh, um, a breakout room according to the theme. Either you can go to one of the speakers or to another theme and uh, enjoy uh, half an hour of uh, conversations and discussions with your colleagues and over half an hour, we will close this first morning of this conference. So uh, Carl, please um, open the breakout rooms. I see the- Yes, but not, not now. First one, uh, I got some uh, messages from people who can't join the breakout rooms. And, okay. And probably that's because they work uh, through the browser, the browser Zoom. And when you have the app of Zoom, you should be able to join the breakout rooms. So that can be the problem for some people. Okay, so in case you have problems, please uh, download the app and then uh, enter. Uh, uh, then you will be able to enter the breakout rooms and just uh, uh, join the smaller groups for some nice conversations. Unfortunately, we have to take uh, care of our own beer and tapas and hopefully next time in a real conference uh, we can organize for that so enjoy the lunch break in the breakout rooms <laughs> <laughs>